I did want to warn you, this is the last time you're going to hear the theme for year six. Uh-huh. So sad, but it's fun. Warning. The following podcast contains two morons talking about sophisticated subject matter, like ninus and hoo-hahs. Also, a few whoopsie-daisies and at least one house or ante. If you don't have a strong stomach, you know where the door is. Right. On with the shenanigans, then. The podcast which you are about to hear is an account of the tragedy which befell two washed-up losers. In particular, Court Psyops and his immature co-host, Matt. It was all the more tragic in that they were uncultured morons. But had they lived very, very full lives, they could not have expected nor would they have wished to see as much of the mad and macabre as they were to see each week. For them, an idiotic podcast show became a nightmare. The events of each week were to lead to the discovery of one of the most bizarre crimes in the annals of American history, Cinema Psyops with Court and Matt. What is Psyops? Psyops for psychological operations is very simply the art of influencing how people feel and think and ultimately how they behave and what they do. You don't have to defeat the enemy on the battlefield. It's better if you can convince the enemy to do what you want him to do without having to fight him. And that's really the intent behind Psyops, to convince people to do what you want them to do. So how does PSYOPs fit into what's happening now? The two points I'd like to make with you and the audience is that, first and foremost, PSYOPs save lives. The second thing I'd like to say, a lot of people have misconception about PSYOPs. They think it's something devious and brainwashing. you don't know exactly what's going on right now but we do know that there are some psyops going on right ma'am i don't know cinema psyops and i believe with all of my heart that it is a contributing factor to our juvenile delinquency of today why i believe that is because i know how it feels i know what it does to you cinema psyops they think it's something devious and brainwashing to the final episode, which also happens to be the 312th consecutive episode of Cinema PsyOp. I'm your host, Court, and joining me live all the way across the city of Omaha is a man who's only still alive by virtue of the fact of my wife's mercy. It's my co-host, Matt. These are all facts. Uh, by the way, you may sound like this is our last episode, but you just said it that way. You said the last episode. You mean of the season. Of your six. Of your six, Or yeah. do I, Matt? I, 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 well, considering all the movies you just uploaded, I, yeah, I don't think Shush! you can all that. You're ruining oh, it! Sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> Way to dig up the lead and proceed to defile its corpse in front of its mourners. <laughs> well, you know, everyone has a job to do at a funeral. <laughs> Oh my god, that's so fucking inappropriate. <laughs> Even I'm grossed out by that. God damn. We I've finally do levels. Yeah, we finally reached homeostasis, right? <laughs> we, well, well, we know what six years of this show's done to me. So there you go. <laughs> well, my my original hypothesis of Cinema Psyops was if I torment you with the same stuff that I've watched my entire life, will it warp your mind as well? And the answer is yeah. yes. Is it just the stuff we've watched, or is it me having to talk to you every week, once a day, for a few hours? Tomato bastard, whatever. Same thing. (laughs) Uh, Wow. (laughs) We've reached the end of Phantasm. Yeah. I can't believe it. Yeah. So, this is a very, very interesting movie, so we need to preface everything that we're going to talk about with this film. Uh, Number one. I'm not even going to bury it. I fucking loved it. Awesome. I'm really glad that you liked it, because I did too. Um, it means every movie in this series I liked. Yeah, yeah. I was hoping that that's the case. Um, I'm glad and that- I could not believe this came out in 2016. Really? Yeah. Well, I mean, everything was going- I mean, I didn't know, like, before I started watching it, it came out in 2016. Like, when I started watching it, and then all of a sudden, I'm like, wow, everyone looks real fucking old. 
And then I'm like, and everything looks a bit more crisp and clean on the videoing front. And that's, I looked it up and I was like, holy shit, 2016. Well, all right then. <laughs> okay. So what a lot of people know is that this film actually started its its life as a uh, sort of, it was kind of going to be like a web series and it was going to be based basically around or completely around the exploits of Reggie. It was going to be a Reggie centric series. And I, yeah. I can't remember the name of it, but it was like Reggie's two fisted tales or something like that, where they were going to take it like into a, like a sort of comic booky stories of Reggie on the road, fighting a tall man solo after the end of Phantasm three looking for Mike. And yeah. they were going to kind of do it as a web series. And they just kind of really tinkered around with it a little bit. Now here's the interesting part. What a lot of people don't know. And I just just found out from watching the behind the scenes documentaries on the arrow video box set of the various phantasms uh-huh. how this actually got started there was a guy that was working with don coscarelli i don't know if he was an assistant director or what it is that he specifically did but he's the one that ended up uh directing ravager okay okay now he has been making like lots and lots of short films and let me look up director real quick this is fucking riveting short okay so david hartman <laughs> uh david hartman was the the guy he'd been working with don coscarelli for a while. I guess uh, it was like John dies at the end and then some other projects that Coscarelli was involved with. David Hartman had been working with him. I don't know if he, what, what the position was, but they had actually gotten pretty close. And I mean, it seems like pretty much everybody who comes into Coscarelli's life becomes fast friends with him. You know what I mean? Like, it just seems like he's such a supporting and open guy. So this is what basically yeah. happened. David Hartman, uh, to tell the story, this is like from the documentary, he says that he had uh, made a suggestion with Don, hey, you know, I make short films just for the fun of it and it's super cheap to make now and you have this great digital technology and you can just kind of throw stuff together and see what happens. You know, I usually just like shoot a film in a weekend just for fun, like a short little film. Do you want to do one together? And Don said, yeah, yeah. What do you want to do? Well, David Hartman being a super fan spelled P-H-A-N, which now you Matt, are officially a fan. Yes. Now that you've seen them all and you like them uh, all. I've seen you're, them all. You're, yep. you're a P-H-A-N <laughs> fan. I, I definitely am. <laughs> but anyway, David Hartman being a big fan, attic of Phantasm, decided I did, hey, well, let's do a short. Like, let's do a Phantasm short. And he's like, you can use it for like a DVD supplement, like an Easter egg, if or whatever. If you if you end up liking it, you know. And if we don't end up liking it, or you you don't you don't like it, and you don't think it's usable, then we won't use it. Well, they go and they shoot some stuff, and it ended up being the the stuff with Reggie on the farm yeah. uh, with Don. And then um, they ended up really liking it. And then they just kept doing it. Like they didn't know what they were doing it for, but they just would go out. They would write scenes. They would come, you know, grabs a couple things. And then eventually they decided that they were like these little vignette stories, you know, where it would be like these tales, the two fisted tales thing that I was talking about, where Reggie's just, you know, roaming the land, doing some stuff and their little individual stories of just shit that happens to Reggie while he's on the road. Well, uh-huh. they shoot that stuff and they get to the web series developed and then they get up to about 40 minutes worth of footage. And then Don oh. suggests, let's just turn it into a full-fledged movie yeah good idea the director uh david hartman at the time didn't even realize during any of these right but don basically had david doing the directing on all of this stuff like all of the Mm -hmm. like the the farm um all of these different things for the web series and stuff and don Mm -hmm. was stepping back and sort of doing like a like doing an executive producer or producerial work but also because he's don was making sure that like you know uh the director had everything that he needed because that's what don does he just makes sure he gets everything going and you know so it wasn't like a shadow directing thing it was more like an assistant director type thing and executive producer rolled into one you know is what he was kind of doing but he really was hands off and just let David do what David wanted to do with it now they co-wrote it together so there's a lot of elements and David actually admits that he was trying to lean more heavily on Don than even what Don wanted like he kept trying to bounce ideas off of Don because he wanted Don to make sure that it turned out the way that he wanted it to but mostly Don just was like you know trying to kind of push them out there and like do it you know have fun with it and experiment with it now one yeah. one of the reasons i suspect that that's the case is uh david hartman is actually an animator by nature and he drew up all these storyboards he came up with all these plans and if you've ever like, if, you, if you can see the behind the scenes art it's actually pretty fucking cool you know like really cool stuff yeah. and he did draw it kind of comic booky in some ways too especially when they were going to do the web series version of it mm-hmm. and so that aesthetic and that like animator's eye and that detail really kind of helps moments in the film that ordinarily you would really kind of be eye rolling about because the motion still feels very real even though the CG doesn't really look that effective. Yeah, I, 
it, it you know what it felt like to me um at times with the with the gra- the CGI graphics is like one of those specials you see on sci-fi yeah. that was done for like the sci-fi Yeah, channel. a sci-fi channel level of special effects, right? That's yeah. that's kind of probably the money that they were working with was that level. And yeah. remember, this is stuff that they were doing on the weekend for fun as a bunch of friends. That's yeah. the point. I mean, exactly. That's awesome. And then they turned it into a movie. So what we are seeing here is Don Coscarelli going back to early filmmaking roots with um a director who who really kind of hasn't, I guess, really directed before, I guess, or at least hasn't really like hadn't had a chance. And then Don just basically let him do all these shorts and they were just having a good time. And then everybody else starts getting involved when they decide to turn it into a movie and they just keep bringing back as many people as they can. And they're just getting together with old friends and hanging out and having a good time. Yeah. You know, that's awesome. Yeah. Some amazing, amazing behind the scenes stories in this movie. But I want to, I just want to preface that because while the story is excellent and while the motion and the various um, action sequences when things are moving is believable. The CG is definitely rough, but they stretch their movie and their budget for the movie like you would expect for Don Coscarelli. And it started out as a web series. So some of the stuff that may not look as great, you got to remember that might have been the sections that were supposed to be for the web series. And yeah, so they, yeah. they didn't reshoot it. So what? It may not look as amazing as you possibly want it to in your head, but the mm-hmm. fucking fences that this thing is swinging for is yeah. so goddamn ballsy that I have to respect what they're trying to do. Yeah, it still gets the story across, and you know what? It's still, that's all that matters. It's my favorite story of the whole series. This is my favorite story. It's, it's, that's all that fucking matters. Like, that is the thing about this franchise, is the characters. You love every single one of them. emotionally at the end. Oh yeah, I fucking cried my ass off, man. Let's, okay, all right, we're already reviewing it. Let's, let's. I mean, yeah, we just get going, because I'm really excited about reviewing this. Before we dump in, I just want to say that we actually do have two pieces of feedback. We have written feedback from our boy Fancy, and then uh-huh. um, the head honcho from the network has spoken. Uh-oh. I don't know if it's good or bad, Matt. I just know that the head honcho from the oh. network has spoken because he heard Are that we we're... we in trouble? Maybe. I don't know, but we'll le- yeah. at least leave this lead buried for now. Yeah. All right, all right. This will keep it quiet. <laughs> oh, hi there. I didn't see you. You call me cutting a new show. I'm Bo Ransdell, and I'm one of the many creators you can find on Legion Podcasts. I said quiet! My fellow podcasters and I work hard to bring you the best in horror podcasting, but that comes at a cost. What's that like to live deliciously? Not that, but also, yes. No, what I'm getting at is that there are server costs, costs for good microphones and software for editing, all the things that make our shows, you know, fun to listen to. And you can help. If you're enjoying the shows on legionpodcasts.com or in the Legion Network available on iTunes and Stitcher, just about anywhere you can download a podcast, really, you can help us out and get a little something for your trouble at patreon.com forward slash Legion Podcasts. For just two bucks a month, you get a pair of movie commentaries exclusive to Patreon, and for five dollars, you can also join us for a monthly screening of a movie. All of that available on patreon.com forward slash Legion Podcasts. We appreciate it, and thank you for listening. Now, back to the cutting room. She gives good score to this film. Definitely. Oh, yeah. Definitely. <laughs> they spent some money on somebody with some kind of synthesizer that really took some time to do this shit right. Because this score really is effective in this. It is. It's really good. They even use yeah. it in this trailer. There are some schools of thought that suggest the possibility that one could be in two places at once. I can't tell what's
what's real anymore. So I wander, following the tall man's path of destruction. One eye out for those spheres, and the other for him. He is clearly delusional. <laughs> Not even real. You're my bad dream. Stay out of my way. Oh, it really is an amazing story. Epic, actually. trailer kicks ass boy oh that was creepy it, I mean, it was like all of my clips so there we go uh, <laughs> well of course you would have picked the best and, stuff and this is a heavier clip movie because this has a ton more great dialogue seven clips yeah there's a lot of focus on telling story through dialogue but also doing it in such a way as to build suspense and dread i can't wait to talk yes. about that the first 20 minutes of phantasm 5 ravager uh, well, Reg emerges in the desert in the same, his ice cream guy get up, carrying the shotgun, heading on the highway. Uh, and actually, it's our first clip. 110 degrees. No food. A few drops of water if I'm lucky enough to find it. But it still feels good to be back home. If this even is home, I can't tell what's real anymore because of him. He's a shapeshifter. With superhuman strength, he enslaves the dead, uses them to create terror. He has the power to channel time, dimensions, even dreams. He was a scientist in a past life who crossed the threshold to a red world and came back changed. His sentinels, the brain sucking spheres, have blocked every path I've had at finding my lost friend Mike. The bastards are toying with me. I know they're here now, somewhere, clocking me. This tall man, he's taken everything from me. My job, my best friend Jody, and now his little brother Mike, who I swore to protect. They're gone. And I'm alone. It's just me now. My name is Reggie. Okay, so before we go into it, I just want to say, before Ravager existed, upon finishing Oblivion, I thought to myself, you know, Reggie is a great fucking character. Jody yeah. really had part one. Um, Mike had part two and part three, and then really had part four. No, but, and Reggie had great moments throughout everything, but Reggie never got his own, like, like his moment own movie. Stuff. Like, like in, yeah. f in Oblivion, like, Mike got, like, some heavy shit that was all about him, and then Reggie had a solo mission that he had to do, but... But it seemed almost like a side mission to Mike's. Right, he was he was comic relief, and he was, and it was something that we lamented in that that um, that movie review. We actually said that Reggie, while kicking ass, still is a lot of the comic relief. They're they cut to Reggie whenever they want to lighten the tone with Mike. And I lamented how I didn't like that. I wanted to see Reggie like you know kick more ass and get more severe. And I think yeah. I think I had said that I prefer a Reggie who is just over this shit, where it's like, yeah, I'm gonna go too, but you know, I got all these fucking grenades and I got this fucking four barrel shotgun and I'm going to take as many of you fuckers with me before I go. Like that's the Reggie that I know and love, you know? And yeah. I, I feel like we had been getting away from that in the other two movies and I'm fine with that because I still love the the cornball fun loving Reggie that we get who still kicks ass when it's time to kick ass. But what I had been lamenting and what I had been kind of wanting, Don Coscarelli apparently had heard my concerns as well as David Hartman and I feel that they have more than addressed that because this opening, just this saga sale alone is like, holy fuck, Reggie's like the hero 
hero of the fucking apocalypse in this one. Like you can tell, you know, it's like, yeah. Jesus Christ, how long has he been wandering the desert? Look at that outfit. What the fuck? How old is he? What's going on? Like I'm fucking in yeah, just I'm... with that opening and that's all they needed. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh pretty fucking awesome. You want to know where he's coming from? Well, he's raiding destroyed homes, getting supplies. Uh, we see while he's raiding a home, actually one of the spheres is you see a shadow of a sphere killing a guy. Well, uh, Reggie's walking down the street. All of a sudden, the fucking car shows up. His car is there. Uh, he uh, laments how the car was fucking stolen. Yeah, he said some douchebag or something came yeah. along and just fucking plucked it out from under him, and he's pissed about it. It's like Mad Max level of pissed. Yeah, well, I would be too. Yeah, well, it's, it's a hemi fucking, fucking car that pulls up. And the the guys will t- give Reg a lift. He's a real weaselly asshole looking character for fifty bucks. Reg gets in, gives him the fifty bucks, and he starts talking about how he had a car just like this and where he parked it, making the guy real fucking nervous. And then Reg, and the only you know I had in this compartment in the middle of the center console, I had uh, this gun loaded up with these great bullets. And the guy goes for the gun, and Reg goes, "Oh." I was mistaken. Opens up the glove compartment. There's the gun. Points it at him and says, get the fuck out of my car. So, of course, Reg takes all the guy's clothes, leaves them in his underwear, tells him have a good fucking day and starts driving off. The guy who was in the car was uh-huh. a staff writer or um, something involved with Fangoria. And he had uh-huh. written he had written this glowing review in Fangoria of Phantasm 3. So Don Coscarelli invites him out to lunch with uh, Angus and himself yeah uh if you write for fango and that offer comes of course you're going to take it right of course so yeah. like i guess they had become friends and then when they started making this you know when, when it was time to like just shoot stuff on weekends he jumped at the opportunity to be in the film and like he thinks it's great and he's having a great time and he was so nervous going into this shoot he actually had a panic attack because he was like so excited and nervous that, <laughs> about it oh, all that's, that's fucking awesome yeah, like he's like <laughs> you know he's like such a fan like he actually had to go to the doctor like he was so scared and then like when he's telling the story like obviously you would be proud of that that like you yes you were that nervous right yeah yeah (laughs) obviously okay and the role that he gets is perfect for somebody that's like that because it's really fucking demeaning yeah yeah i mean it's it's it ain't it ain't it ain't the best part uh, but he <laughs> well, plays it well. You really hate this motherfucker. Right. And the thing that's awesome about it, though, is what everything that Reg does to him and then everything that happens to him, you do not feel bad for him at all. And No, it he just, deserves all that shit. Right. Before it gets really, really bad. And then we like, you know, start talking bad about the character, not the man playing him. I just wanted yeah. to point that out that he was such but a huge The man fan. played him seems like a nice dude. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and it's also it's fucking great because it really is like a Mad Max thing where it's like somebody stole Max's car and he just tracked them down and found them yeah exactly that's, yeah that's the level of reggie badass we get in this movie and i'm i'm here for it all fucking day dude yep you're gonna have to rein well, me in like you did on part two i'm sorry not a problem well the two balls show up one kills the guy standing there and the other chases reg well we have a nice little chase scene between the two balls and reg uh at one point he locks one of the balls in the uh uh in the in the glove cum box he shoots shoots the other one with seemingly unlimited amount of ammo and a handgun but i don't give a shit it, it seems great to me. Um, Red seems like the kind uh, of guy that can handle running from a ball, driving a Cuda backwards while reloading in Colt 1911 with hollow points. Yeah, I, I, uh, I got that feeling. I got that feeling real good about that. And the, the one uh, he locked in the glove box, he also shoots the living fuck out of it to keep it in the glove box. Yes, he does. Yes. Um, so he's able to destroy the both the balls after a nice little chase scene. It was a good little action to pick you up right away. Right. The CG's a bit ropey, but like it's so yeah. much goddamn fun and they're just going for it. Like I I'm, would, I'm giving it so much leeway and I don't give a shit. I'm already lost in everything, so I'm not noticing that the CG C, uh, CGI is a little wonked. All right? I'm I'm really not. I'm so invested to see what happens that I'm I'm all in. I look at this like what it basically was. It was a project of love made by a Phantasm fan. It just so happened to be on oversaw by the guy who made the original series of phantasm and like co-wrote it with him this was like a project of love between two people that wanted to tell a story of phantasm again and that's you know they did it on the budget that they could and i love every minute of it it is awesome it's it's beautiful (laughs) it's Um, great everything about it is like come on let's put on a show and you forgive so much it doesn't matter well while driving all of a sudden Reg wakes up and he's in a wheelchair being pushed by Mike and I mean what the hell and he looks older much more ragged and that ends up being our next clip where the hell am I (sighs) you're safe 
I'm, I'm safe. Oh, that's good. I'm safe. Where am I safe? Where, where, where is this place? Reggie? Reggie, you've been my rock. When Jody died, you were the guy that took care of me, and I will owe you forever for that. But, but why am I here? They found you wandering in the desert like Moses. <laughs> Mike. <laughs> Buddy, I've been looking for you for so long. And now you're here. Yes. You're right here. <laughs> But this is not right. Not here. This is not right. It's complicated. Okay, I'm listening. Come on, spit it out, Mike. Yeah, um... There's been a diagnosis, and you have dementia. Dementia. Early onset. <laughs> but there's therapies and there are treatments. And there's this beautiful place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Come, come, come on, Mike. And we're together. Come on. You don't believe that crap, do you? Because you're not alone. And nah, not this, is one, uh, what, this is one. just another one of his tricks. Oh. Yeah. I see it all now. All right. Okay, listen. The doctor said I'm supposed to keep you engaged. Keep your mind active. So... Tell me the story from the beginning. Again. Holy fuck, what are they trying to do to us? It's okay. I know we should be saving this for the, when the 20 minutes is over, but I can't. So now I'm in this mode where I'm like, no, no, it's the tall man fucking with him. This is how I'm seeing things. This is how I'm seeing things. I'm I'm like, this is the tall man fucking up. But in the back of my head, I'm like, are they honestly going to St. Elsewhere us? Where all of this story was just, it's just because Reg got Alzheimer's. Dementia, they, actually, they, like a complete loss I'm of sorry, reality. D- yeah. D- d- dementia. But it would be a St. Elsewhere situation. And I'm like, they're not. Are they really going to do that? That's in the back of my mind. But forward in my mind, I'm like, nope. This is some trick. <laughs> this is something that the tall man is doing to fuck with Reggie. Is uh, is somebody going to wake up and suddenly JR's not dead? <laughs> yeah. JR's not or, uh, Yeah. JR, uh, Patrick Ewing isn't dead. What, or, or not Patrick Ewing. <laughs> it's a basketball player. But, uh, the other brother, Patrick the, Duffy, not JR. He's a, yeah, he's gonna be in the shower and <laughs> shit like that. <laughs> okay, I can see where you had those fears of what was going to happen, like if that's how it was going to happen. Um, yeah. But I will remind you, um, the the you that is experiencing this, had you contacted me about this and asked me that question, is is, is it going to be like they're, we're going to get sane elsewhere? I would have reminded you that you have to remember the Phantasm series always gives you more questions than answers. <laughs> Always does, and you're you're not wrong. And I remembered that. I was like, oh, you know what? Let's just let's just calm down a bit. I can't I can't live you know like this, and I gotta give it time. That's why. But in the front of my head, I said, listen. It's it's got to be uh, it's just the tall man fucking with all of us. Well, the fact that they do this thing where Reggie just all of a sudden kind of comes to and is being told that he has dementia and is being put in a home and that Michael's still alive. The tall man we know for a fact has fucked with people's reality or perception of reality for as long as we've been introduced to him. He even makes yeah. himself like his first introduction is he made himself look like the lady in lavender to be able to murder a person for their corpse. Oh my god, I'm just getting so stoked to get to the end of this. I know. <laughs> but I want to enjoy every minute of it. Because right. I'm so, like, that's <laughs> what I think now, but what I think by the end is so different. Right, but I, I totally, I'm going with you on this ride, because the very first time that I watched this, Matt, those were the same concerns that I had that you're voicing. Yeah. I did not want it to be that it turns out the entire time it's just been Reggie's mixed up recollections because he was diagnosed with dementia. Just like I didn't want the whole entire thing to be a dream in part one at the end. And I didn't yes. I didn't also want the whole thing to be just the dying hallucinations of Michael's brain. 
you, mm-hmm. you know, like I didn't want it to be that like was yeah. the end. But th- the way that the film does it is it lets you decide whether or not you want to feel that it's that and you get to make the decision because it always gives you more questions than answers. Um, yes. It never makes anything super definitive and it's kind of always open to your interpretation. And that's what I enjoy about the series. So um, your your voicing of concerns is absolutely 100 percent at this point in the story warranted. I think that everybody that has watched this for the first time probably felt the same as you, although they didn't phrase it as Saint Elsewhere does. Yeah, <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> no, you're totally valid. Let's keep going. All right. Well, uh, he says, you know, tell me the story. And Reg says, well, it starts how it always starts. I'm looking for you. And then, and her is in uh, a, a woman. And sure enough, Reg uh, comes across a woman whose car is broken down. Uh, she opens it and she's like, thank God. Oh, I thought you were somebody else. I thought you were a friend of mine. He's like, wow, you have a friend who drives a classic Cuda like this? Far out. Yeah, it's, it's nice. Must be nice to have friends like that. Um, <laughs> right, because it's a really rare car, especially yeah. in 2016. Yeah, exactly. Um so she says she lives on a farm with her farmhand, Demeter, and he, he gives her, you know, Reg gives her a ride because, you know, Reg is always super nice. And, you know, he, it he gets hard on the road, Matt. It. it gets it gets so hot on the road. <laughs> it gets so difficult, Mike. So um, that night, uh, he, you know, they're kind of hanging out and he tells her the story about tall man, his search for Mike, all that. And and then he kind of, like, starts thinking about putting the moves on her, but she puts a squash on that. So he says, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write you a song. This is fucking um, smooth. This is a better yeah. method of writing a song to try yeah. and enchant someone. The only problem is, while he's writing the song and singing it, he uh, he forgot her name. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> that's well, fucking and then hilarious. I decided to go ahead and say that's the end of the opening 20 minutes. Nothing's more Reg. Creeping, then fix it so you're kind of pulling a smooth move, and then fucking that smooth up completely. <laughs> yeah, there is that, right? There is totally that. <laughs> but that's our Reg. I wouldn't have it any other way right now. <laughs> I think we've covered a good portion of what we needed to say in the 20 minutes while we were covering yeah. it. Um, the, the setup, when we get to the point where, you know, Reg is like, you know, trying to romance a chick and he can't even remember her name. That yeah. That is so perfect. And this is the stuff that they shot first. This was how they decided to do like a little phantasm thing just to have fun with it. This little oh, nice. interaction with Don. I don't know how far it goes with like, maybe it's just him picking her up. Um, but I do know that there is some stuff that they had shot that they didn't end up using in the final Final film that involves some stunts and it's at oh, this wow. it's at this point before the stunts start getting too crazy but every stunt that we see the character of reggie do reggie the man himself did damn that's awesome yeah so my respect level for this film has increased tenfold just because yes. this is reggie's fucking swan song right this is reggie going i'm gonna give everything i got in this film that's awesome any i think this actor who played Reggie gives everything he's had in all these films. Well, his name so. is Reggie and the character's name is Reggie. So you can just say Reggie because it's pretty much the yeah, same yeah. person. That's, I mean, that's true. You're, you're not wrong. Yeah. Just Reg, Reg being Reg, man. And it's, it's fucking great. And I'm already ecstatic about this fucking show, uh, or about this movie. Yeah, totally. So we start in the next 20 minutes. Um, she actually kind of tosses and turns at night and decides, you know, fucking Reg doesn't seem so bad at all. And, uh, you know, uh, who knows, uh, you know, what else she's fucking thinking. But, hey, you know, whatever it takes, um, you know, for Reg. Uh, because we all love Reg. So uh, let's uh, let's uh, let's face it. Right. She yeah. considered it and she knows that he's a drifter and she's going to take a chance at it, because what if this is that one in a million chance to ride like this, you know, excellent specimen of a man who just so happens to not be so hot looking in the facial region? Yeah, well, I mean, but maybe he's bald. Maybe he's uh, maybe. Yeah, he's bald. Well, men he's... tend to lose their hair because they have a lot of testosterone, right. Matt. Right. That's what I keep telling myself. Um, <laughs> I know that's what happened in my case. Same, same, same. Um, <laughs> no, it's not same, same. It's the same, asshole. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll let you have this after 312 right. episodes. Thank you. Well, anyway, um, she actually tucks him in and goes to sleep. But outside, we see the outline of the tall man and a ball watching them. Creepy. It was, the way they put the tall man in there, th- it made it look where you only saw his eyes. And his outline was, yeah, that was creepy as hell. Yeah, they did an excellent job with the judicious use of Angus. Yes. Was he alive at, still at this point? <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, did he get to see the finished film? Yeah. Yes. 
Okay. And that's, so that's, that's a, what I'm yeah, that's mad. Yeah, that's yeah. a whole story. That's a whole other story. But he got to see this finished film. This was his next to last appearance in a movie. Oh, wow. Okay. So I don't know what else it was that he did. I don't know what his last film that he shot actually was, but uh, this was his final Phantasm film, and this was his next to last appearance in film. Damn. All right. And he did get um, to see the completed version of it. And uh, awesome. it's a really lovely story the director tells, but I'll share it at the end of the review because it's it's too touching and moving. We got a lot of the touching moving stuff to get through. J- Jesus. All right. Well, anyway, Reg wakes up and he's in a old timey hospital, like Civil War type hospital next to the tall man. However, at this point, he is still Jebediah talking to Reg kind of normally saying that, you know, I he hates to be a bearer of bad news. He goes, but he thinks they bring them there to die. Um, then he, he turns to the tall man and he tells him his attitude at least. And he tells him he will never be safe. And that he's always watching. Then all of a sudden you look underneath the bed and his hand is morphed into another bean. And it's the lady in lavender. And she looks fucking scary as shit. <laughs> yeah, that was pretty demented. That was. And I'm assuming that's the original Lady in Lavender. She definitely is in this film in another scene, so I, I don't know for sure, but yeah, I'm guessing. Yeah, I'm just guessing with the way how this movie went. Yeah, there was a lot of um, makeup and things like that, too, that was like yeah. distorting her face. So I couldn't really tell for sure if that was fully her, but that was like a representation of her. Yes. Yeah. So Reg then wakes up. Um and uh, he wakes up, he, like his eyes open, and he's in the wheelchair with Mike. And then he wakes up again, and now he's on the couch on the farm. Fucking, this movie's going to be a mind fuck. Reg then remembers, as he looks outside, seeing how beautiful morning it is, he remembers the lady's name is Dawn. Well, he calls out to her, and he hears some noise, so he goes to check on her, and a sphere is killing her. Drills into her head the whole bit. This was, was grotesque. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it was, it was pretty fucked up. They went overboard he, with this film, man. He runs out to the car, and he gears up with every form of weapon imaginable. Machine, uh, a submachine gun, a uh, samurai sword, nunchucks, uh, 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 a shotgun, but not a four-barrel, regular shotgun. Um, he runs, and, uh, he, and he hides in a barn with that b- farmhand after some, you know, problematic situations with it, because, you know... Uh, he's, uh, you know, they, they don't speak the same language at all. Um, <laughs> oh, I thought you meant problematic as in, uh, cultural, uh, you know, degradation or punching no, down. They, I mean, Reg didn't do anything, but too yeah. much, but they just don't speak the same language. Right. And um, I, I don't know what that guy is actually speaking and it yeah. could just be the tall man fucking with Reg at this point. Um, yeah, it's... but yeah, it was like a really awkward, weird situation. And the guy's like threatening him with an ax, or at least it appears to be because he seems super angry and. Yeah. Reg is carrying a fuckload of weapons. And then they both watch the ball destroy a horse, killing it. That was fucking grotesque. Uh, that was gross too. Uh, <laughs> and when I say this... that when I say that they're going overboard, I mean that with the same kind of sadistic glee that I talk about all gore effects. Yes. This was horrific and grotesque, and I couldn't get enough of it because I was just like so fucking shocked to watch the ball kill a horse. Yeah, well, I mean, it's it's good time. Yeah, um, I'm just grateful that the CG made it a little more obvious that it wasn't as real, but the horse falling and the horses acting, you know, it's one of those like collapsing horses that it's trained to do this. It yeah. made it feel so horrific. It, it really did. Yeah. Then the ball gets in there, the deckhand fights it, but it gets into his throat and kills him. Um, He's not a deckhand. No, not deckhand, uh, he's a farmhand. Right. Uh then um, Reg then wakes up again after watching it, and he he kills the sphere. But then he wakes up and he's with Mike again, and that's our next clip. Hey, Reggie, you still with me? Where'd you go? Someplace else. It's uh, all starting to run together. Yeah, you got to listen to me, Mike. There's this threat. Have you seen it? Seems like I'm the only one who wants to stop it. Well, you've told me about it several times. You know the the grave robbing guy from another dimension? He does seem like a pretty potent adversary. You should know more than anyone else. I've been thinking a lot about what you've been saying over the last few weeks. Seriously. You know, there, there are some schools of thought out there, some philosophies, religions, some quantum physics even, that suggest the possibility that one could be in two places at once, along a, some kind of shifting 
time stream, parallel universes, you know, stuff like that. There's this one theory called a uh, membrane theory. And it's the idea that thousands of universes are all sort of spherically stacked against one another. And ours is just one of them. And at the places where these universes touch, Uh, I'll just send you the book. Mike, you're not listening to me. Books I don't need. A fucking four-barrel shotgun is more like it. Man, you are not listening to me. Wake up. That son of a bitch put me here. He put you here, too. Wake up, man. Don't get agitated, okay? Please, just relax. All right? It's probably time I should bring you back. Everything's all right. Whether or not you believe that the tall man is making it f seem like this is what's happening where Reg has dementia, or if you really are starting to believe that Reg actually just happens to have dementia, whichever one you, you're, you're going to kind of choose here, whether it's just a new version of the tall man torturing him, um, or or it's um, this is just the truth that Reggie has dementia, that doesn't mean that the other films didn't happen. It just means that battling the tall man for this long and having his reality warped so many times has finally done his brain in. Well... I have now changed my own ideas about what is happening after I saw this. And that is this. Mike's actually telling him something very important to listen to. And that is, um, unfortunately, uh, due to fighting the tall man so much, going through so many doorways, he has now broken down what are uh, 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 the realities that he shifts into now. So... Now it's it's fucking it's all it's all real. Everything you're seeing is actually happening, but Reg is going in and out of uh, uh, different dimensions. We know that the tall man works in dimensions. That's one of his most important things. That's what the doorways do. They work in time and dimensions, or fucking TARDIS doorways, and that's what and Reg is working through different dimensions of himself. This version of reggie he really is sick and and dying and uh not, not you know doing very well um uh so and then you go back to the version of reg that's been alive you know this whole time and, and the original reg i guess you would call him but yeah that i mean that's what it is and that's me at least that's what i'm thinking all right um i do not disagree with what you're saying um however your reasoning for how this is happening with these reggie experiencing multiple dimensions without having to go through the gateways um i actually kind of think of it a little bit differently right mm -hmm. okay so these various universes that they're talking about where the membranes are stuck on top of each other and if you get close enough to a gateway you can cross over well he doesn't want to hear that because he doesn't want to be stuck in this home anymore because he knows he doesn't belong there. Okay, I will give you that this is a multi-dimensional, like every different type of version of Reggie that could exist is in this film, and we're jumping around in those different versions of Reg. Um, but what and not only that, but Reg himself, who started all this with the tall man, that Reggie, he's going into these different versions of himself. That's why, and he's gone through the doorways probably so many times, and not even that. It's probably not Reggie's fault this is happening. The tall man is getting stronger. The tall man is getting more potent. And the tall man's plans are conversing more, which is probably causing these issues as well. All right. The way that I'm seeing it, when we saw Reggie go through that gateway in an attempt to save Mike one last time, Mm -hmm. That trip is this film. Whatever happened to him, he became every version of Reggie all at once. His consciousness, the thing that we know Reggie as for that we've seen through these films, the Reggie that we know from the third movie, that's where I'm taking it from, is he jumps through that gate at the end to save Mike's life, right? And that's the last thing that we see. He's yeah. literally trying to jump into the afterlife. So, you know, like it's basically like this is like it's almost like him trying to, you know, grab Michael back from the clutches of death. But so there's a, a there's like every single version he's now like become self-aware and he's like every single version that he's ever been his consciousness is just basically jumping around like he's being pulled through all these different versions of himself that exists and he's basically getting information and being told what's going on but it's too much for him to process. He can't handle all of the th all of this that's happening. Now, at the same time, one of those versions of Reggie happens to be a patient who is just been diagnosed with dementia. And let me say that word again, dementia. 
<laughs> right now yeah you stated the tall man works in what dimensions dimensions yes okay and he's got dementia now dementia is essentially a loss of reality like where you just kind of you drift off you know um like it's a loss of reality and you lose touch with what's really happening sometimes you get lost in memories and things like that i'm just kind of going by what i remember for the diagnosis uh-huh. everything that we're experiencing is absolutely the effects of a brain that is suffering from dementia but our version of Reggie that jumped into that gate that we've been following all along, the one that you're talking about, like, let's just call him Reggie Prime because he's kicking ass and taking names with everything the tall man throws at him for all these years. He's being afflicted by the version of Reggie that has dementia. So the scattered brain nature of him not being able to keep himself in one specific reality or even just to choose a reality and live it in this like multi-dimensional thing, it's because the version of him that has dementia is like causing problems for everybody else because they're, they're you know what I mean like that that problem with that brain is ri- having a ripple effect from every other aversion and affecting him and that's what this movie is and that happened because of this jump through the gate in part three that's that's how I've always interpreted I, it I guess I could see that as well I mean I can see both of ours as well yeah that's... and it's obvious that that's what we're doing at this point because we've been jumping around so much that we can finally yeah. t- just talk about it because that that's that's the rest of the story it doesn't change from this point and that doesn't spoil anything by analyzing what it is but like I think it's from the jump of the gate just because I'm taking it from the linear story from the previous film because that's where we're building off of. Um, yeah, and I take it as the the tall man because he keeps getting more powerful and getting all the shit. He's he's weakening the dimensions. Right, which is what is aiding and abetting what's happening with Reggie. The region, the reason yeah. that Reggie is doing this is because he jumped through the gate and became self-aware of all of this. Like, and he was there. He must have jumped through a gate like a, at one of the membranes and basically just got connected to all Reggies across yeah. the board. That's how I'm interpreting Could it. Could be. Yeah, and I'm just determined that the tall man's fucked with dimensions enough, and Reggie's stuck with him and on his tail enough that Reggie's dimensions are all just getting completely fucked. Yeah. Well, okay. Yeah. He's definitely jumping through dimensions and he is experiencing the problems or the symptoms of someone who has dementia as well while he's battling the tall man, which is absolutely horrific and just keeps stacking up the discomfort and the fear for what's going to happen to poor Reggie. Like this film does not let you rest at all. It does not. Well, Reggie snapped after this talk with Mike. He snaps back. He's in the woods. Uh, he's back to Reggie Prime. Uh, he hears Mike calling his name, and then Reg uh, sees a giant sphere, and it's above him. And he also sees his two the two pronged doorways there uh, are also there for him. Um, we go back to dementia, Reggie and Mike, and and Reg is laminates about he doesn't want to die there. And instead, he wants to die shoving four barrels right up the the spheres and the tall man's ass. He he wants that to he wants it to be done. Uh, but he doesn't want to die I think, in a hospital. He doesn't want to die this version of Reggie. He would rather die any other virgin version of Reggie he possibly could. He wants to go out fighting. He doesn't want to Guns fade away. Blazing. Yeah, he doesn't want to fade yeah. away and just sort of slowly drift off and lose Which himself a piece of his time. the spirit of all people. Right, but I think what really is happening with this speech is this is Reggie really realizing that this is the tall man punishing him, and he needs yeah. to figure out a way that he can still go out on his feet, because this isn't how he's going to go out. He's not going to let the tall man let him just rot away slowly over time, because that's well, the worst point, thing you could do to him yeah and at this point now mike's gone and uh he reggie walks around and he finds a doorway now in this reality well both versions of reggie decide to walk through the doorway um at this point reggie finds the tall man and he were at reggie prime he finds the tall man and that's our next clip oh piles cross again you uh, got me in some kind of trap here don't you where the hell is this? Not where. When? The year is 1979. The funeral home where first we met. You call it morning, sire. In three days, your younger self will attend a funeral here, and events will be set in motion. Right. <laughs> You've tried to thrust yourself in my way for years now. And what has it got you? Your loved ones? All gone. You 
slaughtered my family. You... They're all dead. None of you ever listen. When the time comes, they don't die. They come to me. And your point? You want to see your family again? I'll give them to you. Your wife, your daughter. I could return them to you alive, healthy, if I were so inclined. Where are they? But I would require something from you in exchange. And that is? I have plans to make things better for everyone. Just stay out of my way. Of my way. Let the plan complete itself. I want my friend Mike back. And his brother, too. No. You stay away from him. He is mine. Always. Always. Perhaps you need time to think this over. But be quick. There's little time left. And that's the end of that 20 minutes. Oh, well, that's perfect. And I feel like what the tall man was telling Reggie is that Reggie is now like a lesser version of him. And yeah, he's like, I think so. you're going to cause me a problem. I need you to not exist. I will give you the version that you and I know of Reggie, everything you want if you go away. Like it's a last temptation of Reggie moment that we're going to see coming up. Right. Yeah. And I feel like that's because Reggie is now as powerful in a human form because he's connected to all the versions of Reggie and he knows all the stuff that he needed to do across those versions or those worlds. He's having trouble processing it all because he's only human. And the tall man processes it and knows everything that every version is doing and is cool and can handle it. And that's what makes him so all powerful and evil. So it's obvious that uh, the tall man has been fucking with Reggie, but also Reggie is experiencing multiple multiple dimensions all at once. And it seems like the tall man may not be aware of that. I think that the tall man just thinks that he's got him in the insane asylum and nobody believes him. Like, I don't yeah. I don't think that he knows that Reggie is experiencing anything other than, you know, constantly being talked down to by Mike and tortured like that. Or <laughs> and he may he not does even, and he doesn't care. Yeah. It, or it may be part of his plan and he's just trying to break Reggie. Reggie's will and, and get him to stop fighting uh, something, you know, because or, Reggie's clearly standing in his way. He even said it like we, yeah. we talked about that. Or it's, it's very much he doesn't care what Reggie does. He knows all these things are happening. But the more Reggie tries, the more he sometimes fails. And that brings him happy. You know, he's just like, ah, it, it's almost like uh, you're. You're, you're funny to me. You're funny to me to see. Yeah, he does tell him later on that he has been amusing to him. Like, he's just been a fucking yeah. joke. And, like, he's trying to talk him down. And I've noticed that this is sort of what the tall man does. He negs you, like, hardcore, yeah. more than anything. Like, when he can't get you any other way, he just has to talk down to you. Like, he used to be so yeah. fucking disparaging, calling, you know, calling him boy, like, all the time with Mike. Mike you know, he even, calls Mike boy when he's an adult. Yeah, he's a grown man. He still just calls him boy. He talks down to him. He's just like, you're no match for me you're a joke like he's just constantly doing that even when mike's got him on the ropes and has got him scared you know yeah and i love that no matter how many times reggie and everybody has dealt with the tall man and they still kill him and then there's just another version like we kind of get an answer for that <laughs> yeah well uh all right so jesus Oh, you already feel like you've been through a run here in the first 40 minutes of this movie. Yeah, and I feel like we've been talking about it a lot longer than we actually have. Like, I know we're really digging it, in on this one, but there's a lot to fucking talk about, too. There's, yeah, I mean, there's more still to come here. There's, like, so right, much so fucking the, story just jam-packed yeah, yeah, into this. But, well done. Like, it doesn't feel like there's too much story packed into this. No, no, it's just, like, my brain can't process it you know and i've watched this several times and i'm still finding yeah. different little things that they jam-packed story-wise or little winks and nods and stuff and i'm stoked about it yeah right um the next 20 minutes of uh, reg backs out and of this area he's in and he's now back in a mausoleum he looks around and we see dwarfs running around or at least one dwarf running around behind him then we see the woman in lavender walks behind reg but reg doesn't see her as he walks, he, she then appears right in front of him. Uh, she's coming up to him, and he's just kind of not reacting until he remembers her stabbing him in the first movie. She then screams and has the scariest fucking face I've ever fucking seen. That was awesome. And he sh yes, and he shoots her in the head, killing her. Then the hallway turns into a cave entrance. Well, he explores the cavern and kills a dwarf that's in there that attacks him. 
All of a sudden, the tall man brings him up, and like on this, they're on this floating, you know, platform, and he talks to him, and that's our next clip. Have you considered my offer? Yeah. Go back to hell. Yours or mine? One might say we're in it together. Your playthings don't work here. You could leave this rat maze if you chose and be with your family again. But my generosity is fleeting. You will have no more chances beyond this moment. Do you think I want your reanimated zombies? But I will take back my friend, Mike, and his brother, Jody. If you free them, I'll step out of your way. Why? Why are you so obsessed with these two friends? You could never understand. It's called loyalty. Those frail human emotions again. Do you not understand? Your kind are simply skin sacks of water and meat. And when a few random electrons fire off in that puny brain of yours, you're ready to annihilate yourself for this, this feeble sensation you call loyalty. Like I said, well, I guess it's time for me to be going. Who brought this on yourself? You are an unwanted pawn in the game. Ah, your tenacity has amused me, and I've enjoyed your despair. But my use for you is at an end. You're not even real. You're my bad dream. Jesus, what a cut down that was. I know, man. That's a fucking dressing down of uh, an epic proportion. Right. It's Jesus. kind of all the tall man has left, right? Like, he's trying to make him feel like yeah. he doesn't even matter to him. He just wants him to go away. Exactly. Well, um, he uh, wakes up and he is strapped down to a table uh, with two metal rods. In, you know, uh, his head is in between two metal rods. Um, he then is rescued by a little person and a woman. When they take off their masks, the woman looks just like Dawn, but actually her name's Jane. Um, so uh, they get him loose and the body next to him is all the heads caved in with a metal... Uh, ball within it, uh, with the sphere in it. Uh, they, uh, leave, and the, uh, they, the little person's name is Chunk. And Reg and Chunk talk about how the tall man uses those machines to get information from him. And Reg is obviously starting to lose it pretty bad at this point. Reg is then, uh, left alone for a bit, and he's attacked by a dwarf, but Chunk saves him. Then a group of men show up, and it turns out their leader, after he takes his mask off, is Mike. So, holy shit. Welcome, welcome back to this Mike, I guess. <laughs> oh, well, this isn't even, like, is this Red jumping around in time to where we see that he actually will have to fight at the end of the world as an old man? Like, that's what they're hinting at, right? And he's still in his ice yeah. cream outfit. So this is another possibility of what happened to Reg when he got thrown through that portal to try and go save Mike, right? Yeah, yes. <laughs> so, um, they find out he's, he finds out he's been, uh, hooked up to that machine since they blew up the tall man with the hearse in the desert a decade ago. Um, they, uh, decide to head out and when they open up the door to the outside world, we see the world has now belonged to the tall man. Uh, there's giant orbs in the sky blowing up the ground, people fighting hundreds of dwarves running around everywhere everything's on fire and completely red so um maybe not the way you wanted everything to go for you um, <laughs> yeah it looks fucking nasty as shit like this is such a like why are they why are they even fighting anymore at this point why don't they just yeah. give up and die like what is worth saving at this point well, that's the human spirit <laughs> just sometimes most most people especially if you make it that far in the apocalypse at this point Maybe it's not even about saving anything as much as this is about saying fuck you to, you know, and put, doing as much damage to the things that are going to kill you eventually as, as you can. Well, that's, yeah, it's, that's the reg that we get in this film, and that's also the mic we get in this film. We get to see the people where it's like, I don't care if you're going to take me out. If you're going to do it, I'm going to make sure I take as many of you with me as I can. Like, that's, yeah, that's, the, exactly. that's the frame of mind that they're in now. Yeah. 
Then we cut back to Reg in the hospital. Um, he's kind of walking around very, you know, in a hallway. Then a nurse grabs him. And then right as the nurse grabs him, he's back with Mike in the wasteland. Uh, and he's being actually grabbed by a grave digger. But Mike is able to kill the grave digger, saving him. They run. And again, he's back in the hospital. Uh, and, uh, looking around and looks very lost. And then all of a sudden again, back with Mike in the wasteland. So he's jumping quickly now. Um, all of a sudden, uh, he, uh, he, uh, uh, after he's kind of brought into safety, a guy's out in the hallway and a new sphere shows up. This sphere is deeply red. And then all of a sudden spikes come out of it, impales on the guy's head and blows up his head, killing him. And that ends that 20 minutes. And what we're going to next is the final 20. We get a lot of story. I'm going to say this again for a movie that's an hour and 26 minutes. Yeah. yeah. It's amazing how much story we're getting. Uh, The spiked ball that we just saw that blew up, that is apparently called the suicide sphere. And uh, they purposely made it red because they're fully owning the fact that they look like Christmas ornaments. (laughs) (laughs) Right. Um, Because he's like, well, we've had black ones. We've had, you know, gold ones. We've had uh, silver ones. So now we're going to do a red one, you know, and his whole reasoning of that was that he would always grab Christmas ornaments as a kid and pretend it was like phantasm and like chase somebody around the room with them like oh, that's awesome the director is one of us man <laughs> he totally is yes. you know uh I, I just wanted to point out right so we've got the giant spheres we've got this apocalyptic world where it's like worse than what terminator 2 looked like for how hopeless it is for people yeah our world yeah, has been transformed terrible yeah our, yeah our world has been transformed into their world basically at that point <laughs> yeah um, right it's yeah because the world's red it's you know apocalyptic yeah it's basically like war of the worlds if they didn't catch a cold yeah yeah exactly (laughs) if if shit didn't go wrong (laughs) right so this film is throwing so much grim shit at us and at the whole time all i can worry about is please don't make it to where i have to watch reggie die (laughs) and don't 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 make don't make me watch him die in a bed please (laughs) don't do this to me yeah i don't want this to happen that's the worst thing that you could do to me don't make me watch reggie die in this (laughs) i'm begging at this point and let's just go ahead and finish it god damn it all right the final 20 minutes well, we're back in the hospital, and Mike visits, and that is our next clip. I'm having a problem, Mike. Listen, I had a dream last night. I can't get oriented. I'm I'm slipping in and out of time. I am one minute, I'm in the desert, and then I'm talking to you. You're telling me how I got diagnosed, and I'm in this place, and then, uh, then I'm nuts deep in a war zone, man. That's the whole point. I, Reggie, I had your dream. That whole story you told me about last week. (laughs) We even killed one of those tall guys. We blew him up with a hearse. It was a very real dream, Reggie. You went after the tall man, and I, I, I found myself in the desert, alone, following his path of destruction. I went looking for you with a gaping yellow wound in my head. Did he actually put something in there? Or was it always there? Here's the thing. I can still feel the connection to him. If only I could find you, Reggie. The world had changed. A full-blown invasion was underway. An all-out attack against the world we knew. Governments collapsed, society crumbled. An alien virus was unleashed. People were sick, and eventually their heads would swell up until they popped. The body count was immense, and there was no cure. It's bad shit. We tracked the source to the tall man, and we've been fighting him ever since. But, you know, I never stopped looking for you, Reg. What a fine use of our time that was. You know what? I cannot tolerate this anymore. I'm done. I'm out of here. I'm done, okay? 
just I man, it's just so Reggie. Like I'm not gonna break. I'm just gonna go. You're done. I'm, I mean, I'm done with this shit. He just doesn't even care where he's supposed to be. He's just done running around and jumping, and he's done having all these different consciousnesses to like wake up to constantly. Yeah, <laughs> it's awesome. He's just like fuck all of this. I'm done. Yeah. And I think it's important to figure out that um, Mike's talking. We see Mike sewing his own head shut. That was pretty cool. And this is where the CGI gets questionable, but I still like it. Um, the end of the world. Uh, you know, the, all the spheres showing up. Uh, every, uh, you know, you, it's a great scene where the, like we try to launch a missile attack against the tall man and some dwarves standing next to him. It's fucking just. It's it's. I think it's a great scene. I admire the ambition, and I yeah. love the B movie gumption of fuck it, let's just do it as best we can. It's very, yeah. it's very like Bert I. Gordon in 1950s sci-fi, and um, I'm here for it. Like, if you're gonna just fucking go for it, then just fucking go for it, and uh-huh. you give me a good enough story, and I'll, I'll go, I'll go along with you. I don't fucking care. Uh, I can acknowledge yeah. that the effects might be a breaking point for some people, and they just might not be able to take the film seriously for that. And mm-hmm. um, it's too bad for you if that's the case, because this. This is yeah. a shitload of fucking fun, and I don't even care. Yep, I'm, I'm, I, you know what? You, you be critical. You want? I'm gonna have some fun. Yeah, you go ahead so. and suck all the joy I, you want out of that. Like not like yeah. in the CG. I'm just gonna enjoy the implication of the gigantic fucking warship spears that are like so much more deadly than the tiny little spheres that I was already terrified of. I'm good. Yeah, I'm good. Exactly. I'm good with the ambition, even if it doesn't look that great. I'm, I'm good. Yes, same, same. I'm <laughs> like, I'm. I'm just fine. So we're back in the wasteland now, and the tall man shows up with an army of men. And Mike gets a rocket launcher and blows them all up. Then cut back, Reg is back at the hospital, and he's kind of wandering around again. Then Mike grabs him back in the wasteland, and we find out the tall man has Jane. Uh, They go to the tall man's dimension. They go through the doorway, and they go to his dimension, and he tells them, that there are thousands of tall men across all dimensions. And we and see it. Actually, we, we see it. An awesome visual of all these tall men just waiting to go. Um, Mike, uh, actually a sphere flies up to Mike, and Mike's eyes go all sphere-like, but he's able to blink it away, almost like the tall man doesn't have control over him anymore. That's his sphere. Well, the- Remember, he said he was still connected to it in the clip, kind of. Oh, yeah, that's right. Okay, that was his sphere. Nice. Yeah. Um, well, the, the tall man gives the gravedigger a look, and the gravedigger breaks Jane's neck. This causes Chunk to unmask himself as Chunk was disguising himself as one of the dwarves. Fucking brilliant he, that they did this, right? Like, this yeah, was their strategy because he can get as close as possible? Yep. He kills a shit ton of them, and then, while well, strapped with grenades, he says, get out of here, and he blows up to the, the dimension. Well, uh, we they go back through the doorway, Mike and Reg. And uh, Reg is back in the hospital yard of dement, you know, where he has dementia. Uh, as a doctor and two nurses are about to grab him, the dimensions open up and almost merge. And Reg gets thrown the four barrel shotgun. He blows as the dimension takes over. That's the wasteland. Uh, those doctors and nurses were actually uh, a grave digger, and he blows the living shit out of him. Uh, with the four barrel, which is awesome to see that the four barrel came back. Um, they're shooting guys, they're running and shooting, it's great, but they're running out of ammo, and then all of a sudden, the fucking car shows back up. Drives over, with Gatling guns attached, and blows the fuck out of everything. They open up the door, and who was driving? Well, it might as well be Jody. Well, they drive away, and that's our final clip. Where is everybody? Nobody made it. It's just not getting any easier. So good to see you, Jody. But what now? Where are we gonna go? We're gonna fight harder. We're gonna fight smarter. We're gonna change tactics. We're gonna go north where it's cold. Really cold. The bastard hates the cold. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just so grateful to see you both. We did miss you, Reggie. You know? 
That's a hell of a way to start a trio. <laughs> yeah. As they drive, Reg is finally looking like he's starting to relax in the back of the car, as in he has his two friends back. Well, then we cut to Reg in a hospital bed in the dementia dimension, and he's surrounded by his friends, Jody and Mike. Uh, they hold his hands as he begins to die. God damn it. He has visions of all the versions of his friends from the, the early days, uh, the, from the first movie, the, the, all the way through to even these versions of his friends in this dimension where he, there was no tall man and he is just dying. The, you know, Mike looks at Jody. They are both filled with sadness. But then it ends in the very dimension that we start with Reggie Prime resting in the back seat as his two friends are in the car. They drive away. Roll credits. Well, wait. <laughs> There's a mid credit scene. <laughs> Thank you, Court, for telling me. Yes, thanks, Court, for telling. I didn't fucking. I was like, Court, you know, there's a mid credit scene. I'm like, fuck, no. <laughs> They're aware of it. I posted. So, I posted a photo of that text chat in the group. And nice. <laughs> I, I let them know that I was doing my job and keeping an eye out for them. Yeah. Uh. And, and, and thank God, I was like, oh, what's going on? Because I was an epitome point of emotion. I was. Uh. I was in a glass case of emotion on that one. Well, we see a doorway in the middle of the desert, and Chuck comes out of the doorway. Fucking hand all bloating his shit, but he's alive. Then all of a sudden, a woman shows up, but who is it? It's Rocky! Rocky shows up! You know, she, she bandages up his hand. She said, Mike figured you'd be on your way out. Let's go to the rendezvous point. Well, she uh, he asked for a lift. You know, okay, come on, carry me. So she bends down, and when he goes to get on her back, he gets a handful of boob. Uh, uh, which he admits to doing on purpose and says, come on, it was just yeah. one hand. It's really fucking no, gross. It's just, yeah, it's gross. It's gross. Um, not a good look, dude. So, it's 20 fucking 16. That's not funny. Yeah, that's not cool, man. Uh, so she walks away and he follows. They cut to, they're sitting there. She wraps him up better and uh, Chunk shoots his shot, says, hey, come on. What do you think about you and me together? And Rocky's into it. She's like, well, no other guys are around. Why not? So yeah, until some Chunk, until something better comes along, she's like, "Sure, why not?" And he's like, "Hey, I'm good with that." <laughs> yeah, chunks, chunks, all cool with that. I mean, uh, uh, just let, then, let's let's face it. Uh, if Rocky said that to you, you would probably be cool with it too. Like you'd be like, "Damn yeah, yeah, yeah. right, I would." I'm <laughs> not, I'm not dumb. What, I mean, what's wrong with you? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'd be like, "Yeah, Rocky, let's go where there's definitely no people over there in the desert for a few days." <laughs> Yeah, 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 don't, because it's very, even in Apocalypse, it's easy to find uh, better stock than me. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. <laughs> wait, what? Oh, no, that's uh, all around, that's everyone in the show. Uh, okay. <laughs> so, anyway, uh, then the car pulls up, and they go there, they open up the car, Reggie's in the back going, how the fuck are you still alive? <laughs> and... They both get in there, and they drive off into the hellscape, roll some fucking credits with the music begins, boy. And the winner of best cameo of all time is Rocky in that mid-credit sequence. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Agreed. All right. So they made me watch Reggie die, but they did it in a way where I don't mind. I did realize yeah. that because Reggie was aware of all the versions of himself, he was actually given what his life would have been like had the tall men never came, where yes. Michael and Jody and him were all lifelong friends. And yeah, he. No, no one died. And yeah, he just he had a f got sick. He had a full life. And then he died of the natural causes of whatever took his life in that hospital. That bed. was. That ending scene. I fucking bawled my was, ass no, off. I, I didn't fall, but I teared up, man. Oh, and I was fucking losing and it. Like it was yeah. because they were all there, you know, and it was like going back from time and it, it was all the possibilities. It was almost like all the dimensions of Reggie were all versions of Reggie were finding their peaceful spot. Whether this Reggie his peaceful spot is passing in his sleep while while his friends are with him. Or Prime Reggie, who is together again with his bros, getting ready to fight this manic evil. Um, yeah, I'm just, yeah, fuck yeah. I, I, it just, yeah, it got me. It got me real good. <laughs> when I say the words ball my ass off, I mean, I tear up, I wipe the tears away, and I'm, yeah. I'm uncomfortable, and I feel like I'm, I, like I, I get ready like, to, how, I'm about to how, cry. Like, I, I feel something, and I'm not used to that. How dare you have feelings as a male? 
in our society. No, no, I, I just want to point out, like, I wasn't like when I say like Niagara Falls and things like that. Like, I'm not capable of feeling things like other people do. Like, I, yeah. I don't work like that. Uh, <laughs> like, I just know that I'm really, really sad, and then I just feel horribly uncomfortable, and I don't like it. Well, I got Missy died. I, I don't mind saying it. Oh, no. I got Missy died. I teared up, and there were tears that did flow, and I felt really, really sad. But I'm also like, there's there's shit in my own history to where someone dying like that and the dementia stuff just hits harder for me. Yeah. And then for me also, it's the end of this adventure of Phantasm. Right, and we're watching. Uh, I, we're, usually, I'll be 100% honest, by the time we get to the end of most franchise fests, I'm pretty happy. I'm like, all right, I've had enough of these films. They've steadily either start. They, I mean, most of them just pretty much started out really good, and then it got really, really bad. And I'm just, I'm fucking tired of it, and I don't want to be around it right now. This is not one of those times. This was a franchise I liked. I liked every goddamn movie that was in it. I, it, it and I felt these were well done. I was sad that it was over too. That this is over. There, there, there's no more phantasm to be had. Well, and also this is the first franchise prediction I've ever made that came 100% true because I said it dwindles in budget, but it increases in scope and just yeah. gumption and story plot points and character development. And you get sucked into it and you just don't care that the budgets dwindle. It just keeps getting better and you keep enjoying it no matter how much it may kind of degrade in budget and not having the means to make the movie the way maybe the way they wanted it. Like, yeah. And I told you you weren't going to care. And I told you that it was going to nope. kick the shit out of TCM. And we had already proved it like, what, two movies oh, in or three? Yeah. Two, I mean, but you know what? I always give like, all right, well, two movies in for TCM because I we both like Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2. So, and one. So I'm like, two movies in. That's all they get. And when we watch the third movie of Phantasm, I'm like, well, it beat him. It, it beat TCM because. By the time we got the third movie of TCM, that shit was just horrible. Well, even if you give them the three movies and then you go to the fourth movie, Phantasm still wins. Yeah, yeah. Then you go into the fourth movie, it still wins. And then it goes to the fifth movie, it it definitely fucking wins. Yeah, in five This was my In five films, I, I, we had way more story than what we got in yeah. the seven or eight that was in the Texas Chainsaw, and maybe coming up on nine, which we're not gonna fucking touch. I'm done with that franchise. Yeah, yeah. Fuck that. Uh, I, I, I will say this. I this is my favorite of the Phantasms. I'll say it, and I know maybe that's sacrilege to somebody, but I fucking love this. No, there is so much heart and so much emotion, and there's so much fucking, like, let's put on a show and can-do attitude where while you're watching it, you feel like this is a fan film your friends made. Like, that's what yeah, it feels can, like. This was this was made with passion. And love. This was made with less love. This is like your grandmother's cookies. You don't know what that secret ingredient it is. She says it's love. Maybe it's Molly. You don't fucking know, but you don't care either. With my grandma, I know it's Molly. Yeah, <laughs> that's it, definitely Molly. <laughs> you don't know if it's crack or if it's Molly. Whatever it is, that cookie is the fucking best thing you ever just had. <laughs> <laughs> but that's how I feel about this movie. Um you know what? I that totally respect could... that. It's it's so emotional and it's right up your fucking alley. Like it really gets in, yeah. in it really gets in there and makes you feel stuff. It really does. I just can't get around that. <laughs> yeah, I'm 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 fucking I'm I'm full of feelings, man, about this movie. About you know, uh, sad that it's ending, but happy that it was got to be made, and uh, you know, happy that the people who made it loved the source material. Uh, and didn't want to make a mockery out of it. They they wanted to do something right by it. Well, and I love so. that so many people come back because this is probably going to be the last one. You know, and now that Angus yeah. is gone, it more than likely the franchise won't continue. I mean, I hope not. I I, mean, I don't know how that sounds, but I really hope not because the the phantasm needs the tall man, and I don't want to see somebody else do the tall man. Right. Well, anyway, um, the end of the franchise here, which was probably going to be the last one, and almost everybody comes back. Everybody gets a little moment. The only person that we yeah. don't really see is the kid from the third one who is like Kevin McAllister killing, but I think you were literally the only person that likes him. Yeah, and, and you know what? I didn't like him enough that I wanted to see him again. <laughs> it's just, I mean, the first time you see the kid kill somebody with a Frisbee, you just are so fucking into it, you don't even care. Yeah, and also, listen, he's dead. Uh, you know, because you can talk about Liz in the second one, but she's dead. So, unfortunately, they died. They don't get to make their comeback. 
<laughs> well, or the, sorry about you guys' luck. Yeah, I'm just glad that we didn't bring James LaGross back and did the whole like uh, uh, yeah. Roseanne thing where oh. like she plays a different character, even though it's the same actress who played the sister. Yeah, well, well, or he's 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 he plays Mike in that dimension where number two happened. Or something. <laughs> yeah. I'm glad that I'm glad that didn't happen. Yeah, <laughs> nothing against him, but I, I'm just I'm just happy with how it went. <laughs> right, right, and everything that they used the the reuse stuff was very sparing because they just kept shooting so much stuff because it was so cheap to shoot digitally. And you're right, the the digital photography in this, there's some sequences that were clearly going to be the more web stuff and that was like not as high of resolution, but it never looks horrible. I watched this on my projector, you know, and it. Looked, yeah. It looked great, and it was a huge fucking I, picture. I thought they did the makeup really well. Yeah, the, for like making the guys look older and then younger when they needed, and older again. I, it, I thought that was done really well. Well, the remember the director was also an animator, so there's some CG work that he does in here where he does some CG animation where he just kind of animates like that. Well, Lady in Lavender's face was actually like a CG animation over her face. They didn't actually put makeup <laughs> on her when she transformed into that monster before getting shot in the head. That is awesome. Oh, and all that. That is just really awesome. So she shows up in like, that's her lavender dress that she, she brought. And that's like all she has uh, to wear for the shoot. And she thought they were just going to yeah. do something real quick. And then she was going to be able to go out to dinner and hang out with her friends. And so Dawn then has her come back for another shot and she has to lay down on the ground and get covered in all that goo. She doesn't have another outfit to change into. And they're at a mortuary oh, no. in a cemetery, right? So yeah. she gets up after doing the shot and she wants to get cleaned up after she has all that awful gunk and the blood and stuff in her head, you know, all that shit uh, in her hair. And she is told that there is a restroom on the other side of the cemetery that she can go clean up in. That's all she has. And she doesn't have another outfit. Jesus. They don't have another robe for her or anything like that, you know, because it's just like a quick shoot. But to her credit, she still ruined her dress. She still got down there and did all that for them because it's she for did the movie. It, man. That's, I mean, that's amazing. The story's not done though, right? Okay. All right. Now she tells this story in the documentary, but I just I have to relay this. So she gets up, she goes with the makeup on, still has the bullet hole in her head and stuff, and she goes to walk over toward the bathroom. And there's somebody sitting in like there's a group of people around a grave with candles holding a candlelight vigil in the actual cemetery that she has to oh, walk Jesus. past. So she tries to sneak past while she looks like the walking dead because of the bullet hole and all the gunk and stuff. And yeah. someone sees her when she tries to turn around and like just, you know, go back and they scream. Yeah. They scream. And they oh, all no. the people at the candlelight vigil all run off screaming, she says. And she's trying to like <laughs> wave at them and like, no, no, it's just makeup. Oh, I'm so sorry. Like trying to explain, but they're gone before it's too late. And then she goes back in to the mortuary you know where they're shooting and tries to tell them what's happening because then she actually does end up in the bathroom and it's too small to get cleaned up so she just abandons hope there and then she ends up driving home and i guess she almost gets in accidents because people are staring at her because of how she looks on the freeway jesus christ yeah and then she's like that's the gl glamorous life of movie making or something i just thought yeah, that was yeah, an amazing right? story i had to relay that but i had to hold on to it until now yeah so. all right that's awesome yeah the thing that's great about the movie in itself is all this different stuff that it's so open to interpretation, but it definitely deals with is his main themes, like what it's like to have dementia, that constant loss of reality and that grip on reality and just constantly in and out of a, a, of like a, a real consciousness of what's going on around you, you know, mm -hmm. and it really emulates that really, really well. And they use that by the fact that he's slipping through all these different dimensions and his consciousness just seems to be traveling through all these different versions of himself. And it's just this really cool, really neat idea. And then the way that they finish it, I like to think that the way that Reggie actually goes out is choosing to fight in the apocalypse because at least he'll still have his friends and that's his afterlife where it's going to be a constant battle but he's still fighting side by side with the two people that mean the most to him in the world you know so yeah, he's, this, that's that's his that's his afterlife and that's how he's going to be happy you know is like constantly kicking ass and taking names with these guys and yeah. um so when he transforms there and like you know he goes it, like the the world around him you know just sort of turns into that hellscape apocalypse and they're the doctors turn into grave diggers and he shoots them with the gun i kind of believe that what we're actually seeing is like the the death of that dementia Reggie. Um, but what he's doing is he's actually like, because that dementia Reggie that, you know, has is, is been so terrified of dying, not on his feet. I think he's getting that moment before we lose that dementia Reggie. And, oh. and he dies living like the Reggie in the apocalypse. So he gets that moment where he gives the four barrel blast before he goes and then he's gone. And then that's why we're with that Reggie that's in the apocalypse from here on out, which apparently is our Reggie prime is my guess. Hmm. Yeah, I, I can see that. Um, I think at this point, uh, I think Reggie Prime is the one who's kind of going from dimension to dimension we see, and to me, that's how it is. And now being with Mike again, uh, things are getting more clear for him, 
And when he sees Mike and he's still like in the hospital area in the yard, and he sees Mike in the wasteland area, um, that solidifies their connection. And then the dimensions go back to normal, uh, so that Prime Reggie stays in wasteland area, Dementia Reggie stays in his dimension, any other Reggies that are going around or staying in their dimensions. It's finally been righted thanks to him being with Mike. Yeah, we're and we're saying the same thing. The only thing that I'm saying different is that the dementia Reggie is finally passing on and that's why it solidifies. Yeah, okay. So the rest oh, the you. rest yeah. the rest of the Reggies are coming together to support this one Reggie who is dying of dementia and somewhat alone, you know. Um yeah. uh, you know, Mike's still there but like Reggie's still kind of dying alone, like you know, or Reggie's still kind of dying yeah. alone in this this uh, and the rest of them are there to support him because the tall man was using this Reggie against all the other versions of Reggie because it was like a way to beat him or to get him to stop because otherwise he'll just keep going, you know. Mm-hmm. And now that he's like, you know, he was all connected to all these other Reggies, then there's going to be real trouble because like, yeah. you know, he's never going to get rid of that consciousness that's fighting him until he gets rid of all the Reggies. So we lose the dementia yeah. Reggie that was the weakness. And now Mike, Jody and Reggie finally have one up on the tall man because now Jody has this consciousness from being a ball in different versions. Mike was getting groomed to be a tall man, you know, but then rejected it. And now Reggie has this self-aware across multiple dimensions of fighting the tall man versions of Reggie where he can kind of tap into what he needs to know to know how to fight and he's already gone through the thing that he feared the worst which was dying alone and just fading out it's already happened yeah. but he supported himself you know all the different versions of him took care of him and and got him through it you know and gave him a glorious death where he just got to fade away on his feet like he said you know and then mm-hmm. boom now they're going to take it to the tall man so again it's not resolved it's not over they still have to keep fighting but all versions of Reggie end up in this afterlife where they're constantly fighting with their best buds and I think that's like the greatest reward slash punishment that Reggie kind of deserves both of because yeah. <laughs> this is but, the happiest uh, he's been is fighting with the people he cares about the most that's true yeah oh man what an adventure I fucking love really? this franchise I love it back wow. to front and I'm I'm so happy that you loved it as much as me I was expecting yeah. you to bag on four and five and I'm so happy no. that you loved them both I loved them what, I mean what an adventure just that's that's all you can say. What an a fucking adventure! I mean, nothing else should be said about that other than that. It's what an adventure that is. I sometimes feel like I don't need to make movies for myself because I can trust Don Coscarelli to give me what I need. Right? I mean, you, hopefully, has he made any more? Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. You know what, Matt? We can go through and we can start really doing some Don Coscarelli appreciation, and uh, we'll see if you love as much of his stuff as you think you might. Okay, I, I'm really interested in seeing some of his stuff now. <laughs> I'm so thrilled that you love this this much. But, you know, we're running low on time and we still got some feedback to get through and everything. And we're going to do a quick review of part two before we get there. So I purchased the new box set uh, that is available from, I think, WellGo USA. It's the newest mm-hmm. version that you can buy on Amazon here in the USA. And then you can also get it like in Best Buy and stuff. Uh, the last I saw when it was on sale at Best Buy, they had it for like 99 bucks even, which was the cheapest and thank you george for tipping me off to that and also um peer pressuring me by letting me know that it existed into buying yeah. it <laughs> That's awesome. Sometimes peer pressure isn't a bad thing. Um, and I uh, just a quick review of the box set. That's something I wanted to talk about as well. The new box set from WellGo USA. Um, I am 100% still very happy with the box set that I got from Arrow. But the thing that WellGo USA definitely has over the Arrow box set, the ball is like three times bigger. <laughs> it's so fucking huge. It comes with a with a ball as well. And then it has a free floating stand. So wherever you set it, the the like little like clear plastic stand and makes it kind of look like the ball's floating, which is cool. Nice. Yeah. That's cool. Um, now, I've only watched part two, and the thing that I know for sure that it has over it is but part two has an all-new scan of the original elements or the original negative, and it definitely shows when you watch the film, this one looks so much better than the print that we watched that was in the Euro box set. I'm not ashamed to admit it. I couldn't believe how good it actually looks. Nice. And you've seen it too, right? Like, you would you say the same? Do you remember if it looked better to you or you just can't recall? Um, yeah, I think it actually did. Yeah, it definitely looked better to me. Okay, as far as the differences for the unrated version that's in the Wellgo USA that was not in the Arrow box set, there is... 
like three or four more turns of the ear flying when it gets chopped off. You just yeah. kind of see it go once the ball goes past, but they extend the ear flying and spinning. And I guess that was too much. And they had to cut that for the MPAA huh. to get the R rating. And then this is very weird. Let me let me say this up front, except for maybe a couple things. I noticed that the ear part. Uh huh. Uh, let me let me get off uh, by saying what I noticed first. Oh. These are the only differences I, I noticed. Okay. It's only two: the ear, and then the tall man degrading from the 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 the, the yellow shit that had the sulfuric. Oh, the the amazing meltdown! Yes, the meltdown yeah. was definitely overextended to my joy. Yes, that's it, and it maybe a little bit longer of the scene with the lady topless with Reg. <laughs> I think kind that of. might have gone a little bit longer. Alternate take. A little. I think it was like an alternate take, or maybe yeah. maybe they did have to trim the sex scene a little bit, but yeah. Yeah. So, I f- so technically, I noticed those three things, and that's it. So if you notice more, yeah. c- I'm good on you. Okay, <laughs> so whenever the ear gets cut off, it does more spins. Um, they hold longer on the ear, and there's a little bit of a blood spurt when the ear gets cut off. The, the hole that's left behind it after it saws it off. So they there's a few more frames of that kind of stuff. Then mm-hmm. when the ball sweeps back around and sucks the blood out of his brain, it goes for a much longer time okay like all right um, i wondered if that was it but i can not say for sure so i didn't count that yeah i didn't actually time it i'm just going by how many times i've seen the film and like what i'm used to seeing and like what i feel like you know this is just kind of like where i'm feeling like this is definitely longer and it's definitely longer it goes on to the point where like there is a line where um the horror and the grossness of how much blood is being pumped out of a person goes from horrific to hilarious (laughs) <laughs> you know and they yeah. ride that line with the level of blood being pumped out of this priest's head from that ball like they really do they ride it really hard in this version but like <laughs> it fits with the tone of the rest of the movie and it's so fucking don coscarelli and it's so much goddamn blood and you get to watch the priest suffer for just a little bit longer so i'm in and here all day for that <laughs> <laughs> of course you are <laughs> um you're right about the nudity there's some extended stuff of that i think um there's a different cut or a different version of the tall man breaking through the window i think whenever um whenever uh liz pulls back the curtain and then the tall man busts through the window in part two i think there's a different version of that because he's like i I don't think he's facing differently but it feels like the cut on that is tightened up you know because like like as soon as the tall man is revealed it's like he starts coming through the window because he sees her and i felt like there was a longer delay in the other version for some reason the theatrical cut i don't know why but that's just what i felt so um and then the meltdown is significantly longer uh the tall man being drilled and the stuff pumping out of him is much longer. Um, yeah. The the thing that drills up through the guy, uh, through his chest and stuff, that wasn't any more oh, gory than I thought. Did, did we ever see it come through the mouth? No, we, did, we did not see it come through the mouth, so, so it's turned around. Too. Yeah. Okay. With the drill and stuff, that's very yeah. new. Because um, I was like, okay, I thought, and then I forgot about that. But yeah, I thought that was new too. Yeah, the, I was like, I don't think we saw that. We do see the, the spines coming out of the edges of the mouth, but the mm-hmm. drill in the center, where it obviously drilled the way the whole way through and just kept going up to hollow them out like it that really gross stuff that's a little extended too um in the meltdown um you get like longer progressions between the cuts and like you really see more fluids being pumped out and and stuff like that and it is significantly grosser i also thought the creature that comes up out of the liz monster's back that is the tall man like freddy pillar looking thing Uh i think they held on that a little bit longer in some of the sequences or you saw more of the grossness because i felt like that got cut a little bit more um, in the other version or just felt more chopped up but again that's just uh, just going by memory i'm not 100 percent sure but um just for the look of this print alone um on the way that it is and then the extra gore and everything like that um i was totally going to buy this as its own separate blu-ray if it got released but then i realized that may not actually happen and or i don't want to wait and then uh when i knew the box set was like 99 bucks i'm like i'm going for it because i probably would pay at least half that for that giant fucking sphere yeah right (laughs) because it is it's that fucking cool and i'm i totally do not regret getting it um especially now as i've loved this movies as much as i have uh and you've also loved them too this was so much fun and i'm probably going to watch them again really really soon on that box set version just to kind of see what's different there but i think that's the only real difference than the arrow one is the uncut version of two that is the new print yeah everything else i believe is the same so there you go go forth and get yourself some phantasm folks right jesus (laughs) all right now let's take that fucking break because we still got some feedback to do all right are you having trouble keeping up with the ebbs and flows of modern geekery is the real world holding you back from knowing what is happening in the geeky world 
to answer these and other personal problems brought in by your friends, gaming group, and loved ones, Geek Radio Daily presents daily informational sessions brought to you by the wonderful Billy Flynn, the Flynnstress, and podcasting's Rich Siegfried. They contain such helpful segments as history, geek birthdays, box office results, the latest in DVD and Blu-ray, video game and comic releases. Why, they also have a Sweekly show hosted by the wonderful Billy Flynn and the Flynnstress, which includes interviews and commentary. And to make sure you are informed, Geek Radio Daily also provides you with your daily dose of geek news to make sure you know more than that jerk know-it-all Steve. Visit us at geekradiodaily.com. That's right, Geek Radio Daily. All the geek without the weight. Now available in fine Corinthian leather. listening a little too intently yep. on that, that music. <laughs> Why not, man? Yeah, uh, that was great. But we don't have time for me to sit around and enjoy the music because we ran long on talking about how amazing this entire franchise was, and we only have enough <laughs> time for incoming mail. All right, so the first one, I'm going to do the written uh, feedback that we got from our boy Fancy Mark because the message from Bo, I'm still not sure what that is. So we're going to do what I yeah. know is positive because I've read some of it so far. So before we get called the principal's office, let's let, let's listen to this. Right, right. Now, I'm not going to read the top of it because he's just telling me that he wrote a congratulations message for me and oh, okay so just me saying that is pretty much what he wrote kind of but like i'm paraphrasing it a little bit but here's what he actually wrote and i'm gonna do my best mark to uh go with the punctuation and the way that you're doing this so hey court and matt fancy mark here sorry it's taken me a few to send along some congratulations on six fucking years of non-stop weekly podcast drops i would say the show has gotten better and better as you keep going but i'm going to be honest the show has always been one of the best out there and your consistency is what makes it an easy show to bounce around the back catalog and just listen to shows at random that is true i suppose i i, yeah. I, I, I wow i recommend doing that go back and listen to everything just bounce around um and have fun but just keep listening do what you have yeah. to to make me feel better about myself whatever you gotta do to keep listening <laughs> just please love us i th okay back to fancy's letter here i think i first started listening to you guys around when the evil dead shows went online you have to help me when that was all i remember is it was years ago that was like four years ago five years ago I think so, yeah. Yeah, it was I'm not our second year, so we're on six years, so I, maybe our third, I, that sounds like the kind of thing that I would have done for our third year, right? The end of our third so. year, yeah. Well, it's definitely been quite a few years. It's been at least half the podcast fancy that you've been around. Yeah. And I was hooked right from the get-go. I still look back really fondly on the handful of times I came on to guest on the show, especially allowing me the honor of guesting for my favorite movie of all time, The Thing. Really meant a lot to me and is still one of the best guest appearances I've ever made on a podcast. Yeah, that was a fun fucking recording. Um, and Fancy actually gave us so many fucking drops from that show, and I'm so glad that he's proud and so happy to be on there. Yes. Because, uh, like, the shoot a hot load all over this dog. <laughs> and the shooting, shooting some fucking ropes and all that stuff. That's from that thing was review. That, was that what I was gone for? No, you were here for that. Was I? God damn. Yeah. I'm telling you guys, we've done so many of these. <laughs> I can't remember if I was around for the 
Well, I'm not going to say it because I don't want to give Court another drop. <laughs> but I wasn't so sure I was around for that line. <laughs> I almost said it, though. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So we still have some more letter from Fancy. This is all fucking amazing. I'm, I'm going to get overclimped. Yeah. Uh, really dug the Texas Chainsaw Retro that kicked off these six-year festivities. That's a franchise that has always fascinated me in that two of those movies are what I would consider top-tier horror, and the rest are varying shades of garbage. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, you're welcome. I mean, but they just keep cranking them out, and even the totally shite ones are somebody's favorites for whatever yeah. reason. <laughs> it's true. That is true. <laughs> Anywho, congrats, guys. I don't know how you stay motivated to keep knocking out shows. It's a sickness, actually. Every week for over 300 weeks. We, we, we have attention needs that, that are just needing to be filled but i'm really glad you do as i love the show and i love you guys and i hope you keep doing this for as long as you can stand to and i'll be standing in the stitcher podcast soup line asking please sir may i have another take care Jess. that's fucking amazing fancy thank you <laughs> oh man that was that was fucking incredible man my that was great my head hurts from uh from laughing or reading that too <laughs> Oh, uh, Jesus. Okay, so we only have one piece left, and that's the feedback from the big boss, Bo. Let's hope it's good stuff, right? All right, hold on. Hey, Cinema PsyOps guy. Bo here. First time, long time. Congratulations <laughs> on 300 episodes and six years of utter nonsense. <laughs> it's been great to listen to Matt grow and change as a person who's really so much more jaded than when he started. <laughs> In court, you've been an unflappable source of information and grim worldview that's generally associated with supervillain origins. Not wrong. In short, <laughs> I don't think this show has been good for either of It's good for us, the listeners, <laughs> but that's why it's called Suffering for Your Art. I can only hope you both continue to suffer while the rest of us read the entertainment benefits here's to another 300 and another half decade of great shows oh, congratulations Jesus. guys it's such an honor to host you on on the uh -huh. network and uh keep going don't stop don't you ever ever stop <laughs> oh, jesus that's awesome that was not the way i that was, was thinking great. it was gonna go that's amazing thank you Bo. that was awesome yeah thanks Bo. <laughs> it's so nice to know that uh fearless leader digs what we're doing i mean yes just this alone right like if we think we're gonna have to quit right like we're just gonna have to come back to this don't stop don't you ever ever stop right like that's yeah i mean you know matt i don't feel like recording next week don't stop don't you ever ever stop see <laughs> yeah yeah hey court i think i'm gonna maybe take a uh, three months off don't stop don't you ever ever stop I'm sorry, I won't. Jesus <laughs> I mean that's God, Bo. <laughs> I think uh, like I, I think uh, instead of my real dad, <laughs> instead of like the Stuart Smalley thing where I look in the mirror and tell myself all these affirmations, I'm just going to be like, yeah. man, I don't know if I can do this today. I'm just going to play this. Don't stop. Don't you ever ever stop. And I'm going to be motivated, right? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Jeez, think of all the things that can motivate you to do. <laughs> <laughs> Let's stop this before Bo gets really motivated to kick us off the network for, <laughs> for fucking around <laughs> with his like, audio. He's like. Don't overdo it. All right, y'all overdid it. <laughs> <laughs> you beg me to say nice things about your fucking show, and then this is what I get, you pricks. Oh, fucking goddamn it. <laughs> if you enjoyed this show, then make sure you check out the other great shows on the Legion Podcast Network, like Cinema PsyOps, Cinema Beef, Devour the Podcasts, Duncan and Bo Come Correct, Exploding Heads Horror Movie Podcast, Friday the 13th, Get Slayed, The Hell Ming Power Hour, Hello, This is the Doom Show, Hero Hero Ghost Show, Kill the Cast, Underwater Kaiju from Outer Space, Jerry Hates Action, Legion After Dark, Mental Health, Obsessive Cinema, Discourse, Pick 6 Movies, The Podcast by the Cemetery, The Podcast on Haunted Hill, The Psycho Semantic Podcast, Rick Radio, House of Wax, Dude Looks Like the 80s, Rabbit and Red Radio, The Shadecast, Short Bus Cinema, Two Drink Minimum Commentaries, The VD Clinic, Who Will Survive Horror Podcast, and Witch vs. the Doomsday Clock. With such a widespread of shows, there is guaranteed to be a niche for you to fall in love with. Horror, politics, movies, books, sex, music, commentaries, health, video games, kaiju, action, news, comedy, and opinions that would most likely get you killed in some parts of the world. We are proud to bring you some of the best podcasting in the world. Check us out at www.legionpodcast.com com itunes spotify stitcher youtube and any other dark corner of the internet where podcasts can be found
God damn it. Now I'm sad to see it go. Because we're never going to cover the Phantasm movies again on the show. Nope. Nope. It's, it's sad. This is how I thought I'd feel when we did the Romero films, but I feel a little bit stronger right now than that. Wow, man. That, it's affecting you more than when we did the Romero movies. Yeah. Yeah, because, I mean, don't get me wrong. I like what you would consider the first five Romero films I'm really into. And then after that, it got not that great. But <laughs> <laughs> it, let's just say it ended really weakly, where this just kept going for me. So Yeah, it keeps engaging you even deeper to the point where we never want to fucking stop talking about it, because then that's going to be the last time that we can talk about it, and it's such a bummer. I know. It's a bummer. <laughs> the only thing I'll look forward to is that we have other movies from this director that we'll do. Yeah, we will definitely be covering more Don Coscarelli stuff some point in the mm-hmm. future, yeah. But this is the end of the year. This is it. This is the last yeah, of your six. Uh, I promised you more Giallo in your seven, Matt, and I bought three Giallo box sets. So you're definitely getting more Giallo. We're also getting some real heavy hitters in genre this year, too. Real heavy hitters. But uh, first, we got to go back to your roots, and we're going to have to have you cover uh, some black exploitation because you are the only person to speak of the black experience in film in the 1970s. Who better than a uh, white Wisconsinite Wisconsinite to speak on the black experience in cinema in the 1960s? And 70s. At 70s. It, it's obviously me. How is it not me? <laughs> God, I feel so gross doing that joke now. I really do, too. But at least when we put it in the voice, it's mocking me really badly. So I can I hang my hat on that. <laughs> <laughs> right. We're trying to show the ridiculousness of you yeah, actually yeah, doing the review. That I'm doing that. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're, it's, it's done in enough sarcasm that we can get away with it. If we tried to put more serious voices on that joke, it would feel really gross. Yeah, that's not one you want to play straight these days. If you want to no, find no, that's... <laughs> if you want to find other instances where we have done that joke and we have tried to very much play it straight and we are very uncomfortable about it, but it's out there on the internet and we have to live with doing it. That's legionpodcast.com yeah. forward slash cinema dash psyops our landing and launching page where you can find every fucking horrible thing we've ever done on the internet. Yay! If, I'm so happy the internet exists. <laughs> if you'd like to find other mistakes that we've made in meme form, I would check out our Instagram cinema underscore psyops where Everything Cinema PsyOps related memes can be found. Yes, there are memes. They're not your memes. There are memes, comrade. (laughs) Memes are for everyone. We also have a group in Facebook groups, which is named Cinema PsyOps aptly for the show and that it's in a Facebook groups that it is also a group sick fucks <laughs> yeah i ugh, facebook but you know the group is great i'm um, still having a shitload of fun with all the memes and everything that is facebook group cinema psyops i'm also there as court psyops matt occasionally shows up here and there but doesn't give a fuck anymore as matt's eye up i mean i give a fuck it's just i'm lazy i think it's time that matt um maybe let me take over his email because i don't think he ever checks it psyop matt at gmail.com i don't know you're going to sign me up some weird shit, and I don't need that, so. <laughs> yeah, but uh, you also have a Google Drive that you use for the show on that email. I'm not going to sign you up for shit that's going to fuck up your email and have us lose that stuff. Oh, that's true, yeah. You you probably wouldn't, actually, come to think of it. Yeah. Now, your private email, you better believe I'm going to sign you up for weird shit. <laughs> I mean, you already have. <laughs> Listen, I can't get those lose letters anymore, all right? <laughs> I spend three minutes reading them, and then all of a sudden I'm hooked. <laughs> you can email feedback to court and find out what the fuck newsletters Matt is talking about. Cinemasyopscourt at gmail.com. It's my own personal affairs. It's not your damn business, and I thank you to stay out of my personal affairs. If you'd like to find what weird, twisted shit that we're both whacking it to on Twitter, you can follow a couple of twits to <laughs> tweet a couple of twats <laughs> on the hate filled shit fest turned porn bot heaven that is Twitter. I'm at court underscore psyop there, and he is at psyop Matt. It's typically Harry Potter meets Twilight fanfics, but yeah, whatever. <laughs> well, for Bo and Fancy, who gave us the final year feedback that we needed this year, and for everyone else, all the previous episodes, and I can't remember everybody to name them all off, thank you so much for giving us the love back and helping us get through this full franchise fest. Thank you, everyone, for listening to six years of this unbelievably stupid, mind-numbingly horrible podcast that I don't know why you can't quit because we can't quit. Is that what it is? Do I have to stop for you to stop? Or are we going to get locked in a Floyd where we're constantly going back and forth and deciding on who's going to quit first? Are you going to quit listening or am I going to quit making it? Play it. Play it. What? 
You know what to play. You're doubting yourself. Don't stop. Don't you ever, ever stop. Okay, okay. All right, fine. But we need to stop for this week, so let's kick the fuck out of this week and make it our bitch. White snow, red sky. Reach up for a soul so high. Blue eyes, fake cry. Beware of the fox tonight. Dark rain, my blood in your frozen veins. Dream high, no pain. Run fast in the broken chains. Hello, hello. Yeah. What's up? Yeah. What's up? Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and I'm recording. One, two, three. All right. Awesome. Um, we should probably do the Phantasm 2 thing. All right. After we I- I'm do. I'm going to be 100% honest. I think I see some differences, but you might have to take the lead. Yeah, there's not really much. So I, I think we should All just right. do the Phantasm 2 thing um, as like basically part of the feedback section and just make it real quick because there's very little stuff yeah. to talk about. Um, yeah, about I it. agree. So yeah, just do the move, do the regular movie, and then talk about number two. Yeah, like talk about the differences in the unrated version because it literally is just like mo- like longer gore effects. Is, yeah, is the, it seems that way. Is the main difference. There's a few things that I think I might have seen a few shots that were slightly different, but not enough to where I, I would have to compare them side by side to know for sure. You know? Yeah. But like, there's, yeah, I mean, that's <laughs> there's there's it, this might have been easier to tell if. We've done it back to back. Yeah, but um, the, the main differences that I, I think are there might just be like wish fulfillment on my part. But like, I also feel like they used better takes in this unrated version, kind of. They could have. Yeah. I mean, the movie did seem to flow a bit more. Okay, well, we, we covered some of that already. So I'll just bat that shit to where we need it. And then we don't yep. have to say that shit again, <laughs> even though go. we probably will. But you said you're rolling. Uh, your waveform looks good. I'm rolling. Yep. All right. And you heard me in the clips okay? Yeah. Yep. Heard you great. Okay. There's a little bit of a delay when I hit the clip to when it actually is playing. Um, I'm ripping the last movie of like that big, massive amount of movies that filled up three Google Drives. Yes. <laughs> I'll get those uh, going tomorrow night. My uh, laptop that I'm downloading them onto the memory stick with, it moves the <laughs> when it comes to downloading. So. Wow. That's offensive, kind of. Yeah. Don't put that in. But it's not a very good, uh, not a very, that's funny for you and me. That's not for anybody else. <laughs> yeah, we, so, we're not punching down on the show. We don't do that. That's right. We only do that to each other. And when we're, we're more alone. Uh, <laughs> it, it moves at the speed of court when he's been in Colorado for more than two hours. It moves at the speed of Matt when he has something important to do. <laughs> don't I know that's the truth. All right. Fucking A. Um, I still got to get the theme song done and then I have to get it edited and turned around by Monday night. (laughs) Oh, Jesus Christ. And I also haven't finished the theme song yet and all the stuff that I recorded for it sounds awful. So I have to do that again. And I have like two to three days to turn that around and this episode and get the movie in. Let's get this episode going then. (laughs) Yeah. Busy motherfucker. Bitter bitter patter for you. I'm a busy motherfucker. (laughs) You are, man. Vacations. Sorry, you still hear me? Yeah. Okay, I must have done something that screwed up something because uh, my uh, screen where you were at jumped and I thought I lost you or I thought like Skype crashed. Oh, fuck. No, I'm here. Okay. All right, three, two, one.
and make it our bitch. <laughs> I think that's a great way to go. Good call on that. Uh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> that made a great fucking callback. And I was like, what the fuck are you talking about? I'm like, oh, Bo. So I'll, I'll edit that to make it work better. <laughs> All right, man. Um, oh, shit. I'm still recording. Did you stop? Uh, I uh, No, I haven't. But I have now. <laughs> <laughs> All right, dude. Uh, that's the end of this fucking year. Let's, uh, let's just stop this shit.